Nagas are intelligent serpents that inhabit the ruins of the past, amassing arcane treasures and knowledge. Okay, okay. The first Nagas were created as immortal guardians by a humanoid race long lost to history. When this race died out, the Nagas deemed themselves the rightful inheritors of their master's treasures and magical lore. Hmm. The page of the 5th edition monster manual mentions a few interesting things, but it falls somewhat short. It talks about a humanoid race long lost to history, but it doesn't say who. It mentions that when a Naga is killed, its body simply reforms back to normal in a matter of days, making the creature literally immortal, but it doesn't say how. It talks about the rivalry between the UNT and the Nagas, but it doesn't explain why there is such a rivalry. Let's look deeper into the minds of these magical beasts and explore the past of these serpentine marvels. Nagas are what you would call a monstrosity, or simply the more commonly used phrase, a monster. But what is a monster? In Dungeons and Dragons, a monster is merely something that is not natural, something that wasn't normally born in any of the planes. A human is not a monster because it grew from the prime material plane. An elf is not a monster because it was born on the Feywild. On the other hand, say a chimera, not really born anywhere, but instead created. It's a magical beast, or better put, it's a monster. This also applies to creatures that have changed their shape into something unnatural, for example, the cousins of the Naga, the Yuan-T. Previously humans, but now monstrosities. The Nagas are monsters because they were magically created, and like many creatures that are magically created, they were created for a specific purpose. See, magical creatures are almost like computers. You program it with a task and a purpose, and the creature will make it its life's work to seek that purpose and complete your task. Chimeras, for example, were created to destroy, to produce chaos, to mock life. Humunculi are created to serve their masters. And Nagas? Nagas were created to protect magical treasures. If you want to know about Nagas, you have to understand the Nagas. You have to understand that even though they show free will, even though they are highly intelligent and logical, they are bound by the coding of their masters, and like an itch that they have to scratch, they are made to serve their purpose. To understand their purpose is to understand the Nagas, but to understand their purpose, we have to go back and uncover the truth about this race that created them. Let's talk about the Zoroks. We're going back about 37,000 years, all the way back to the emergence of the creator races, what are known to have been the very first naturally born races of the prime material world. In fact, many of the races that you're aware of are descendants from this big group of five. In this group, we have the Batrashi, a species of amphibian shapechangers whose descendants are the Bollywogs, the Doppelgangers, the Quotoa, and other peace sign shapeshifting races. The Aeiri, who were an avian race whose ancestors are many of the bird races that we have today, including the Arakrokra and the Kenku. We also have the Fae, who even though they originated from the material plane, they left fairly quickly to settle in an aspect of the realm known as the Feywild. We have the humans, of course, who were also a creator race, but more importantly, the Soroks a race of scaled serpentine humanoids who were the creators of the UNT and the Nagas, and whose descendants can be seen in the form of other scaly humanoids such as the Lizardfolk and more. Now, out of all of these creator races, the first to reach success were the Saroks, who formed the very first empire seen in the world. The reason they were so successful was thanks to their god, a powerful entity only known as the World Serpent. Not much is known about this entity, mostly because it is believed that this god sort of broke into multiple aspects, each of these aspects gaining a form of personal sentience and free will, many of them even fighting against each other. The god of the Coatls is one form of this aspect, the god of the UNT another, and of course, the god of the Nagas being yet another. But back then, it is believed that this wholesome, powerful, supernatural entity gave the Sorox the knowledge of smithing and smelting, basically the ability to create iron weapons and armor. And I'm sure that you know what happens when early on in history someone gets iron weapons and armor and others don't. Complete 
dominance and imperialism is what happens. The Sarraks basically dominated the world, enslaving most other races and forcing them into submission. Now, the Sarraks were not dumb in their conquest. In fact, they tried very hard to assimilate other races into their culture. More importantly, they attempted to study the magics of those they conquered in hopes of learning new things. This method of rapid magical learning, combined with the magical knowledge given to them by the world serpent, granted the Sarraks unimaginable discoveries in the world of magic. In fact, it is believed that they were the inventors of the very first stable magical portal, but more to the point, this knowledge allowed them to create the race that is the host of this video, the Nagas. The Sarraks created the Nagas in order to guard their treasures and protect their holy shrines. See, what happened to this empire was very similar to what happened in the Roman Empire, where the Sarraks had expanded their domain so much and accepted into their empire so many different societies and races that the Sarraks were actually the minority in their own empire. Not just that, but the Sarraks delegated everything to everyone else. The army, for example, was comprised of mostly other races. The economy was basically ran by the conquered cultures. Every important location that needed protecting was protected by the Naga, and most important defensive positions were delegated to the UNT. The Sarraks didn't really do anything other than taking political posts. So much as you would expect that this didn't really work out. Sections of the empire started breaking apart, and civil wars would start forming. There were three main capitals to this empire, and each of them fell in their own way. One group left the material realm to become nomadic astral plane travelers. Another resorted to lichdom in order to survive the terrible climate changes that their magical wars were causing. And the last group of Sarraks, facing isolationism but risking starvation, used magic for long-term hibernation. And with that, the empire was gone. Now, a big part of the war was the confrontations between the UNT and the Nagas, who not just suffered strict political differences, but also suffered great religious differences. And they have basically been fighting ever since. This comes from the world serpent sharing many different fragments, and each fragment having its own philosophy and morals. So even though the roots of these gods are similar, they are different enough that it created dangerous warrings between the two groups. In fact, some Sarraks saw the corruption within their own city, and instead of turning to lichdom in order to survive, they begged an aspect of the world serpent known as Jazirian for guidance and help. And this aspect granted them help by transforming them into the first squaddles. The reason that we have different types of Nagas is not because of the different gods, however, but instead because of the different roles that Nagas used to have within the Empire. If the role was to protect a treasure hidden in a deep vault, then a Guardian Naga might have been put in place. A Naga who would decide who would be worthy to take from that treasure, and who would be prohibited. On the other hand, if you wanted a Naga to protect the tomb of an old ruler, then you would just put up Spirit Naga, who would simply prevent anyone from entering. And if the body were to be stolen, the Naga would do anything within its power to seek the body and kill any who took it. This is why different Nagas were created with different attributes and personality types, some being passive and non-confrontational, while others were made to be extremely vengeful and hateful. The study of portals reached its height during the Empire, and many Nagas were also created to protect these entrances, some of these entrances reaching outside the material plane. There were Nagas that were made to protect portals to the elemental planes, and as such were granted powers that could help them deal with the threats that they would most likely encounter. Same with Nagas meant to protect entrances into the Shadowfell. So even though Nagas all share the same beginning, and many share similar proclivities, you would find many different versions, all thanks to the very objects that they were meant to protect. Many of these were not created differently, but instead modified by the latent energies of these portals. Very similar to what happens to dragons who reside closer to portals that enter the Shadowfell. The Shadow Dragon being, of course, the result. Shadow Dragons were normal dragons that were changed by the Shadowfell, either because of physically residing on the plane or because a portal close to them changed them. This is very similar to what happened to many Nagas throughout the years protecting these portals, some of these Nagas becoming more like that which they were seeking to protect. So we have answered two of the three questions. Who were the creators of the Naga and why they hate the UNT so much? At least, 
partially. We, we don't exactly know what type of political differences the UNT and the Naga had, and we don't really know where the religious differences start and end. What we do know is that the aspect of the world serpent that the UNT serve is an evil aspect, the one known as Mershulk. The problem with this aspect is that he is undergoing a very long process of separation from the world serpent, as he disapproves from the core creative principles of the universe. In other worlds, Mershok seeks to destroy the universe, which is probably where the religious differences might come in when it comes to Nagas and the yuan -Ts. This is likely where the main bulk of their fighting actually comes from. The question now though is, how are the Nagas the way they are, specifically their way to naturally come back from the dead. Being revived is actually fairly common in this world of Dungeons and Dragons. Any cleric with the necessary power can beseech their god for a resurrection, as long as the cleric has the necessary tribute. The tribute tends to be, for the most part, the actual deciding factor on whether or not a person can be revived, since this tribute typically takes on the form of a very expensive diamond. The longer the person has been dead for, the more pure and expensive the diamond has to be, since it'll require more power from the god. And most people simply cannot afford this. But generally speaking, as long as you have the money, you can be revived. On top of this, if a god truly wishes it to be, he or she could revive any person he or she would want as many times as it would take. Tyr, the god of justice, could simply favor one of his knights and choose to keep reviving him over and over and over again for as long as he wished. I mean, nothing stops him from doing that. The one problem that all mortal races suffer, however, is one of the many universal truths of reality, which is entropy. A human body is only meant to last so much. An elvish body can last longer, but even they at some point will grow old and frail and eventually die and the person that has died of old age cannot ever be revived again. There is no magic that the gods can give you that will allow you to live past your faded old age. At least not if you wish to remain human. A human will live for its human lifespan and that will be that. If a god were to turn you into an angel, then I mean, yeah, you would become immortal, but then you wouldn't be human anymore and you would be subservient to that god. You know, many wizards try to escape their mortality by becoming liches, which turns them into undead, which is another way to escape old age, though once again, you still lose your humanity. A mortal body is mortal, and that will never be changed. Point is, as a human, even if you were to be resurrected every single time you died, eventually you would still run out of time once your old age kicked in. Nagas do not suffer from this as they do not have mortal bodies, and they indeed have a god that resurrects them every single time they die. Tis indeed not a natural thing for them, but a divine and religious power that they possess, coming directly from their god, Shekid Nestor. <sighs> this is an extremely complex and powerful goddess, being the real creator of the Nagas, the one who allowed the Saroks to do their rituals in order to form the Nagas. She is incredibly complex because, just like the World Serpent, Shekinester has multiple aspects. Three aspects, in fact. And one of those aspects has two aspects of itself, so... Ugh. Each of those forms has their own personality, dogmas, and powers, so it can be fairly confusing. Her three main aspects are the Weaver, the Empowerer, and the Preserver. The Weaver symbolizes active destruction, the one who destroys in order to create room for new existence. She is also a manifestation of connections and knowledge. The Empowerer is a bestower of wisdom in her role as guardian of the young and the uninitiated. And lastly, the Preserver is the great maintainer of existence, being the guardian of the spirits of the dead. Shekinester is so complex that she is described as an all-embracing deity that, in different worlds, she can have a myriad number of interrelations with other gods. She may cooperate with a god in one world while opposing him in another. This comes from multiple personalities and pragmatism that the god symbolizes. But all in all, she represents an elemental force of the process of magical life and transcendence. In essence, she is a god of reincarnation, and her aspect of the Preserver protects and guides the souls of her Nagas, granting them everlasting life and perfect and perpetual rebirth. 
It is said that Chekinester can actually grant this protection to non-Nagas, however she only does so under the most dire of circumstances, and most times only with the approval of other gods. It has been seen in the past that Chekinester helped races who were on the verge of extinction, granting them rebirth and guidance for the race to pull through. Suffice to say, if you were the last of your kind and your race faced extinction, praying to this god might actually grant you permanent reincarnation. Nagas are by themselves not so different from any normal monster. Each of them has their own personality and their range of charisma can vary tremendously. They are not as alien as beholders or as biologically impressive as the aboleths, their culture is not as shocking as the mind flayers and they definitely do not share customs like any of these since they do not interact with each other to form societies. This makes describing Nagas very difficult outside of simply commenting on whatever powers they have or not have. But the important thing to take from this video is to remember the single most important thing about Nagas, the one thing that will truly define this creature. They are immortal. Every Naga that you meet has lived for over 37,000 years. They do not need to eat or sleep and they cannot be killed. And they're also highly intelligent, which means that this monster has been going around the world for longer than many gods. Nagas do not have perfect memories, so they will not recall everything, and it is very likely that they even barely remember the old days, but they do remember a lot about the changes the world has gone through, about the areas where they live, about the people, about the wars, about the gods, every detail I have discussed in this video, a Naga probably remembers. The Naga probably remembers the civil war that tore its society apart. It probably remembers the first war against the yuan -Ti. It probably remembers when the gods walked the earth. It probably remembers when the gods fought the primordials on the planet. They probably remember when they first saw the elves coming from the Feywild portals. This knowledge is what truly describes any Naga that you meet. That knowledge is what is going to differentiate one Naga from another. What have they seen? Who have they fought? Every Naga will have a different answer to those questions and that is what will make them interesting.